So uh, welcome everybody again. Uh, my name is Jesse Dominic, and I'm very glad to be sitting down again with Metropolitan Nicolosi, who is the Georgian Orthodox Bishop of Achalkalaki. 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 There you go. Good. I will eventually get that. Achalkalaki, Kumorda, and Kari. Right. Uh, uh, we 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 had a first interview where we spoke all about. Father Seraphim and his veneration of Father Seraphim, we spoke about how Mayopi converted to Orthodoxy in Georgia in the early 1980s, uh, thanks to a book of Father Seraphim, Father Seraphim's book, The Soul After Death. So you can check out our first interview where we speak all about Father Seraphim. Uh, Mayopi was then ordained to the priesthood in 1991 by Patriarch Elia, who is the current uh, patriarch, very beloved, widely considered a, a holy man. And he was consecrated a bishop. Mayopi was consecrated a bishop in 1996. He also holds a PhD in missiology and patristics. And as we spoke in the first interview, uh, his diocese is in southern Georgia in an area that is about 97% actually Armenian. There are seven monasteries. And there's, we, as we discovered, there are many parishes, but they're being served by one priest. So there's a lot of mission work to be done there. Um. So Mayopi, again, thank you. Thank you for sitting down with us again. And again, thank you to Michelle from Punks and Monks, uh, again, for connecting us and your handling the technical side. And again, Michelle, would you like to tell us again about how you and Mayopi partner together and some of your projects of talking about modern saints and things like this? Sure. So um, I have the great blessing to be a spiritual daughter of Mayope Nicolosi. Um, and, but our, our, um, our partnership goes beyond just spiritual advice. Um, although he's, he's, um, God has literally changed my life <laughs> through, um, Meope Nicolosi's guidance. Um, and that, um, has continued into several projects that we're working on together. Um, one is an eco village in Georgia, um, mm. one is an annual conference that we are in the process of, um, organizing right now called the Luminaries Summit. Um, and, um, specifically the Luminary Summit and, and that project is around the importance of identifying and discussing modern saints, um, mm -hmm. and how they will act as missionaries towards future Orthodox generations, as well as today's youth. Mm -hmm. Um, and Mayope is fluent in English, but struggles somewhat with, um, complicated, complex, abstract theological concepts in, in translating that from Georgian to English and communicating it accurately. And then he also struggles a little bit with those kind of concepts, understanding them, understanding the English description of those things. And so part of the, part of my blessing from Mayope is to assist him in translation. Mm -hmm. Um, and not necessarily translation, but understanding these concepts um, in English. I unfortunately yet do not speak Georgian. Um, I, I do speak some Georgian, but not enough for these kind of these kind of abstract ideas. Um, but I do assist Meope often with um, helping him understand the English concepts um, sure. and also helping his um, message you know, that we have, we have had very lengthy discussions, um, about the topics that I, um, help him with. And so mm -hmm. I understand, you know, what he's thinking and understand his English and understand his limits. And so I <clears throat> assist him in communicating in English accurately for an English audience to understand. And then I also assist in, in communicating to him what some of the feedback is from native English speakers. Sure. Okay. Well, we very much appreciate your Thank your you. efforts, and your help. Thank you. Mayopi, let's could we begin again with you with your blessing? May God bless you. Thank you. So, well, as Michelle said, uh, you're in. You were speaking about this conference that you have, this luminaries conference about modern saints, uh, and that could that leads into what I want to ask you about this time around. And we did speak about it last time that you personally knew St. Gabriel, or Gabadzi, you know, the fool for Christ, the very modern saint of, of Georgia. Um, 
And you have spoken about him in other interviews. I recently watched your interview with Trisagian Films, and I think we could maybe put a link to that in the description. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that, um, well, rather than ask, you, you shared a lot of stories about St. Gabriel, and rather than repeating a lot of what was in, the, in that interview, I kind of watched that interview and formulated questions from what you said there. Um, you spoke about how something very, this is very interesting that Father Gabriel, you said he could see what was in your heart. I'm curious, how did you realize this? How did you first realize that he had this ability from God, this spiritual gift? What was your reaction? I could, I mean, that would be very intimidating, I think. Oh, a holy man knows what I'm thinking. Like, oh, oh, that could be. How did you come to this realization? How did you, what was your reaction? Uh, you see, it's a very serious question because when I became Orthodox and begin to go to the church, so I had some questions. All my questions I was giving to, to my spiritual father and I was receiving very nice answers. But I had one question which I uh, was not able to ask him somehow because I didn't know how to express this with words. Now I can tell you what this was. And when I came, I was just thinking. I wasn't able to speak about this. So in former time, so we have saints. Now they are canonized and nobody, nobody is uh, so... And nobody, everybody is sure that, for example, St. Nicholas is a saint mm -hmm. sure. and some and other saints. Yeah? Nobody questions their sanctity. Now, nobody will ask a question about St. Nicholas. But so he some, somehow he lived among the people. And if you read his life or another saints, and maybe St. Nicholas was from the born making miracles. But there are some and other saints. I mentioned the, why, why the modern saints is very important for us, that they lived among us. Mm -hmm. And then now they are canonized. For example, as I told you, St. Gregory Peradze, uh, who, who was professor in Warsaw University, and he was uh, uh, his lectures was about patri patristics, and then then uh, he was he went to o o Auschwitz, uh, uh, this uh, camp, and then he was killed. And uh, so he lived among people. And the question is that uh, now, when we live in nowadays, and uh, still these people who are living. They are not canonized, but are they? They have to be. They have to exist among us. People who will be canonized in the future. I was thinking like this, and uh, the, my question was how to find them, and who are these people who are among us, and mm -hmm. who then after one hundred years, <clears throat> oh, they will be canonized. Who are these people, and? Uh, the first, uh, the answer was that maybe they are not more because it's modern times. It's uh, everything is changed, no miracles, and so uh, it's not. Uh, I feel the this Christian life. It's not El, It's not life. Christianity. See, just only rules and just only mechanically. So we read prayers. So we have to pray, not to read prayers, but we are reading them. So and and how how to be with it. And when he came to us, uh, I remember this the first time when I saw him. So I was absolutely shocked uh, how he was looked out. So he was uh, uh, like uh, so the old, uh, so ancient uh, monks. And he was very dirty from outside. And uh, he was speaking so very strange things when first time I met him. And his behavior was very strange. Not, uh, not, uh, um, uh, 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 I, I'll find this word now. Um, so, when you contact a person, you you need to be sure that he's. Uh, um, so I find that I, I lose sound a sound mind, a sound yeah. mind. Yes. 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 But. Uh, 
No, I, I find this warning, they'll tell you that this contact is uh, uh, so real contact and uh, authentic. Authentic, and uh, so it's another word, but so I'll try to be. It's it's not Georgian word, it's uh, international, but I forget it. So, and um, so uh, when he was speaking, and when he, I, I feel that. In one hand, he is a little strange, mm -hmm. and uh, in another hand, so I was trying to understand uh, the logic, how he creates these strange sentences, and his strange behavior. I wanted always to watch him and understand what he means, because because it was impossible so directly to understand what he's speaking about, what he wants, and a lot of questions uh, when he speaks. And uh, so I was just only watching. And I needed uh, many, so a few years. Uh, first time I met him, and I think uh, in, uh, in, in maybe it was uh, 1989 or 1990, and then uh, in 95, he died. And I became bishop in 96. But I was priest. I was meeting him. And, uh, and so many hours I spent with him together. Mm -hmm. So and I was uh, trying, first of all, uh, what I was not understanding, I tried to remember. And I always was, was telling to myself that uh, maybe I will remember this now and then later, I'll answer all this question which I have to him. So you were memorizing uh, what he was saying, even if you didn't completely understand what he yes, was saying, yes, so that yes. later you could think more about what he said yes. and understand. Yes. Okay. Yes, because uh, because to understand him, it was necessary. Absolutely, knew knew his life, his uh, person. And uh, so his position to the things. And it was impossible for Zayt to know all this together. That's why I was trying to remember all this. Okay. And, uh, and uh, then later, so uh, this idea that, uh, so you see, I'm physicist. And the understanding, uh, so uh, the phys physicist, how he understands uh, the world. Uh, the idea is that we are creating models some kind of models and try to prove it uh, with experiment. And it's uh, if it's uh, so something different happening, we are changing this model. And so I tried to create a model about him and try to, in any case, how he behaves, how he speaks, to uh, to try its, uh, its connection with my model or not. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this model was correcting and my understanding who the saint is, for example, and what it means to be a holy person. And sometimes he was asking a very strange question to me, to different people too, but to me. Do you trust me? No. Do you trust to me? And mm -hmm. I was thinking, so what he's asking, I trust to God mm -hmm. and how I can trust to him. And uh, now I can understand this, what he was asking. And of course, I trusted to him. That I hear his question was, uh, that do you trust that I am? So he, he couldn't uh, tell that I'm a holy person. Can you trust on me that I'm holy or I'm saint? No, yeah, yeah. but I'm trusting that his understanding of God, it's a true understanding. And so I learned many things from him. And uh, so, uh, for example, once we, when we came to the, I spoke about this, but I want to once more to say, so he was always wasted. And he had this black, uh, how to say it's in this globe book or something. It's Russian. Globe book, yeah. His globe hood. Book, yeah. He always had yeah. his, his hood yeah. like this. Yes yes, yeah. yes. yes. And once we are coming and he just uh, has a paper, so be like this, and it's written by pencil, and it was uh, so put it, fix it on. Mm -hmm. God is love, mm. and he met yeah. us 
looking, God is love, God is love. So he was, he was just only smiling. And so it was very strange because I thought for that time, I was thinking that it's everything, all these Westmen, they are holy and it's not good idea so to fix something on it or uh -huh. so he fixed this scripture in Georgian language. And uh, I wanted to, so to, to later, I was thinking a lot about this, what it means. Uh, so I, this word, it's uh, more, a little more understandable as I was thinking for that time, but, but this action of him, so explained more this, this uh, meaning of these words. So what it means that it's uh, not only God is love, but, he said, it's the most important thing that you have mm. to know that God is love. Mm. It's the most important thing in our face. And later, when I learned uh, Holy Fathers and also the uh, this um, Apostles, for example, it was the last words during many years of St. John, uh, St. John the Apostle, St. John Theologian. Apostle of love, yeah. Yes, and he was, uh, when he became old, he was always repeating, so beloved sons, beloved my spiritual children, love each other. And then they asked him, why you are you repeating this uh, always? So once and <clears throat> second time, but we understand, yes, we'll do it. But why you are you repeating this? Because on this word, he said, included all the idea of, uh, the most important idea of Bible, on these words. And also, he was doing in his own manners or ways. So he put it this, and so he was <laughs> all this day, he was contacting. And during all the week, I, as I remember, he was, uh, well, for example, for example. So uh, I want to say to you that never it happened that my model of saint was destroyed by his uh, any words or actions. And mm. instead, and after he died, and later when we opened his grave, later when we discussed in the Holy Synod, because he was a very controversial person, and many things they were speaking about him, even sometimes very terrible things about his uh, his moral, moralistic, you know, so how to say, mm. behavior or so. And uh, now I know that, uh, now absolutely I'm sure that, uh, so it's uh, it's possible to create some bad stories about any person, even mm -hmm. about our patriarch, for example. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. terrible things that they're creating and they're telling to people and some people trust to it. And uh, so to trust to person, it's very important and maybe I'll give some example uh, uh, for Americans. First of all, they will understand what I'm speaking about. It's very nice uh, modern, uh, how to say, movie or film uh, by uh, Mac, uh, Mac, 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 Mac Lear or no? I forget the uh, name. I'll remember to tell you the name of this movie is Second Hand Lions. Hmm. It's it's for kids. It's very okay. interesting. Madeline's no. I'm looking it up. I remember, Second but Second Hand Lions, huh? Second Hand Lions. Michael Caine. No. Maybe no. No no no. No. Ah, uh, Tim McCann. Tim McCann. Yes, yes. 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 Tim McCann. Yes. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Mackenzie's. So it's. I think it's one of the best movies which ever is made, and it's about oh. this: to trust or not to trust to person. What it okay. means trust, and uh, okay. so it's, uh, it's somehow a theology of this uh, idea in this movie. It's very simple. Hmm. It's about fourteen year old, uh, so teenager, uh, who so who who comes to his uncles. And uh, so uh, they call it to became how how the young person became the man, and so what it means. And I think it's most important the decision to trust or not to trust. It's mm -hmm. about so I think that I think that this idea to trust to him, 
also he it helped them later to me so uh, as i told you he was very controversial and now i'm about absolutely he i was always but uh, i now know what to answer to this i think uh, an important point that meope is trying to communicate is that when you trust the intentions of a person to be good then even when you misunderstand the words that they're saying um you can trust that the motivation is pure and that you must be misunderstanding the words that are being said so and mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. do not trust someone then you don't believe that about the words that they say and they can be taken out of context and misconstrued very easily and this is exactly i believe what's happened with father seraphim so people mm -hmm. who know mm -hmm. that he was a saint and a holy man they can read controversial passages or what they deem as controversial and understand that understand it in the way that father seraphim intended it to be received or people who do not believe that he was a saint can read those very exact words and twist it to mean something that Father Seraphim didn't intend to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this same thing happened with Father Gabriel. Um, he, he had some very peculiar mannerisms, peculiar ways of communicating, peculiar ways of reaching the lost and if you trusted, if you knew him personally, or you trusted that he was a holy man with pure intentions, you could look past some of these things that seemed peculiar and see what his intent was and see the message that he was communicating. But if you did not believe, like, especially if you, you know, coming out of the Soviet period, many people were atheists. And so if you were an atheist, you know, um encountering father gabriel you could take some of the things that he said in the way that he lived and construe it to be something that it wasn't at all very easily mm -hmm. and, I, and i think from reading about him from translating about him and from experiences with other people it's like what he's saying like right now in this specific instance or how he's acting might be completely incomprehensible to me but the person sitting right next right next to me they understand what he's doing is a message to that person, perhaps. You know, and it might not be for everybody, exactly but for somebody, did. it's exactly what they need. This is exactly what Christ did. He spoke in parables to his to his disciples. And they didn't and, often didn't understand. And they often did not yeah. understand what he was saying. Yeah. You know, and, it, uh, and exactly how Maope is saying is that these apostles would would memorize what the words that Christ had said, and then those words would come back to them later. And I don't know about you, Jesse, but this has happened to me many times that I've read scripture that I had no idea what it was talking about until months or years later. And then that scripture comes back to my mind and I go, oh, now I understand. Mm -hmm. There yeah. were more pieces to the puzzle that had to be put in place before we understood them. And with these men who are saints, um it's the same thing we may not understand what they're why why was why did he have god is love pasted to his forehead like i don't get it mm. yeah, and yeah. then weeks or months or years or decades later then we go now i get it mm -hmm. he wasn't crazy he was a very holy man who you know there was a there was a, a grand purpose behind that and now i understand his message when well, may as a saint you know Perhaps we could, you can't really define a saint, but we could say maybe a holy person is someone whose who's, uh, life matches what they preach. So he puts God as love on his forehead. But of course, maybe you could speak to this. St. Gabriel himself also, therefore, because he was a saint, he therefore was full of love as well. I, I'm assuming, right? I'm assuming you could feel his love. Uh, you see... Uh, now it's easier for me to speak about him because I know some other examples like this. For example, I can just, it's my absolutely new experience uh, about Father George Kalch. I knew about him, but I didn't know uh, uh, all what happened with him. 
and mm-hmm. how he was prisoner during one 21 year and mm-hmm. uh, how mm-hmm. he came out and uh, how how it was possible so to stay kind and to forgive and his last word words was that i forgive to everybody even these people who were really uh, so how to say t- yes beating and so making so some so some wrong things and also speak about it. so he forgave and why how it happened it was the same with father gabriel because he had the same experience in soviet prison and mm-hmm. he, they decided to kill him father gabriel and he later told us all the story how it happened so because uh, if not uh, so if if uh, these uh, doctors will say that he's normal he's not mentally ill so of course they they had to kill him to punish uh, how it's in english to punish with uh, to kill execute uh, execute yeah execute him yes and it only way uh, the, so the them not to execute him was uh, so doctor to tell him about him that he is mentally ill and uh, the doctor he understand that he's not mentally ill but he said that he's yeah uh, because so what the op is trying to say is that they um after after saint gabriel burned the um effigy of lenin um mm-hmm. they tried the soviets tried to uh punish him by execution and the only kind of loophole to keep him from being executed would be <clears throat> And so there was a doctor, a Soviet doctor, who was in charge of evaluating his mental health. And he knew that Father Gabriel was a holy man and that he was not insane. But to save his life, he officially declared him insane so that he would not be executed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very close to Father George Alchu because they retell how they were beating them. And uh, he was uh, beat it in the same way. It's I, they say that it's most dangerous when they are beating you in the how to say in the feet in this place. In the soles of your feet. Yes, and they are beating you. Yeah, taking this your feet, beating, and it goes to head, and mm. it's terrible aches. Uh-huh. And, and they beat it him, and uh, so the doctor had to look on his eyes. And if he feels these aches, it's his normal. If not, so he's not. And how he can understand this uh, eyes, this inside is making it bigger. If you if you try not to express and if you feel these aches, mm-hmm. and they became bigger, but doctor didn't say. So uh, how, so he was martyred in the in the in the prison, and that's I think why he had. Uh, uh, he how to say it's in English. Uh, he paid for this love somehow. How so he he's became talking about the eyes is when his pupils were dilated. Right, so right. Pupils were dilated. Then it was I not. Mean, I, I mean that. I mean that. Uh, so he uh, he went through the, all this way of martyrdom, which mm-hmm. in the time the martyrs were doing. Also, Father Calcio, for my point of view, he's great martyr. What mm-hmm. he during a long many years he was feeling. So it was Martin Trump. Because they, they were needed, tortured. They were yes, both right. they from Father George Calcio, they needed just only one word, said they refused something, said no. So it did not happen to something, and so he would be free, absolutely. And also the same, uh, Father Gabriel was confessor, and the payment for this confession, conf- 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 confession, confession, yes. Yes. Great, great payment. He now, so he was martyred, and mm-hmm. that's why after he finished everything and go with God's help, he stayed alive. After this, he was. It was possible for him to allow everything for him. So his free behavior to be full of Christ, not to be contact or um, adequate, for example, it was possible for him because inside of him. He had great love of God, which he proved with his blood, with his uh, so many many times to keep himself so and 
not to be they brave. Were both Father George Calchu and Father Gabriel were both the priesthood was stripped from them during this time period. Right. Um, and it was later restored uh, for both of them. But mm. I think what Meope is trying to say, when we, when in English, when we think martyred, we mean, we think we mean taking the physical life. Um, but what he's trying to communicate is that they laid down their lives for the gospel. Right. They were also right. physically tortured. Both <laughs> And were physically tortured their priesthood was stripped from them but they laid down their lives and it was through laying down their life that they were able to live in freedom hmm. so they were taking up their cross daily right carrying the cross with christ as a form martyrdom in that sense sure right. understood and now it's absolutely impossible to repeat what I told you about inspiration, what uh, Father Seraphim was speaking about, about St. Patrick. So uh, it's absolutely impossible to repeat uh, all this action which Father Gabriel was doing. Mm. Of course, I remember this. I can put on my head this God is love, or uh, so I can repeat, continue to repeat all these things. I can do this, but it will be just on our surface. Mm -hmm. And it will be some kind of, how to say, play, some kind of comedy. So nobody will trust it. And everybody will begin to laugh on me. Yeah, so he could go burn the effigy of some political figure who's controversial right now, but yes. it's, not going to see, it's not going to have the same effect because it's not authentic. It's not from right. the heart. It is just um, imitating what someone else did. And that's not the point of 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 following the saints. It's not to imitate exactly how they behaved and the words they said and what they did. The the most important part is to internalize the love of God that they were living out and ask for yeah, them yeah. to help us find our own way to live out the love of God in today's in today's time period. And of course, I mean, St. Gabriel didn't just one day decide, I think I'll go burn a picture of Lenin. Like he was living the spiritual life that gave him the boldness to do that, that gave him the strength of faith to then endure the consequences of that. So, right, for us to to just imitate the outward action would, as you, yeah, would be play acting unless we have the spiritual life to back it up. Right. So it was uh, before this, he had a... a, a how to say huge job have done work by him, spiritual work. For example, right. so he was uh, in this Soviet period, he was alone, absolutely, who was going to a monastery near Tbilisi, Bethany Monastery, we call it, and mm -hmm. two more saints who are canonized uh, together with him. Uh, these monks, they lived in this monastery and he was giving communion to them. So they were his <clears throat> His real teachers. One of them was from Mount Athos and another from Georgia, but uh, in Soviet period, they were only monks who lived in monastery and uh, they were uh, working very hardly and during World War II, they was giving the uh, food to all the village who is near this monastery. These two persons. Mm -hmm. So supporting them. They were working so many that they were able to do this. So mm -hmm. they were teachers of Father Gabriel. And so he was coming to them. He had his spiritual life. He was he was uh, learning from them how to pray, how to uh, fast, and so in other things. So and uh, so the, it was the result. It was not beginning that he burned this, but it was the result. Right. Somehow, right. with this, he finished his life because he was absolutely sure that it will happen. Mm -hmm. And it was official. And after this, he lived a long time. Right, because he burned, that was in the, the mid-60s, I believe, and he, he lived another 30 years after that. Yes, it's the six they say, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as we, we've been saying, you know, something, but some of the things he did some of the things he said were strange you know he he has he's known as a fool for christ um but something Very you said strange, kind of like when christ said eat my flesh and drink my blood i'm sure i'm pretty sure the apostles thought that was strange <laughs> yeah yeah but it but it was the, but he had the words of life as saint peter said yeah and like and and just as we were speaking about you know the 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 um 
the dissenters during the early church called Christians cannibals. Right. Like they took Christ's Pre- words and turned them into something that they weren't. It's it's the same. It's it's there's nothing new under the sun. This is a pattern that repeats with humanity. Right. We what we want to hear. Yeah. But I, I'm curious, something you said in the Theoria again, the Theoria interview, I thought was very striking. You you spoke about how one time I think uh, you, you were Trisagian. Yeah, Not, what did I say? You weren't interviewed by Theoria. Not Theoria, Trisagian, yeah. Understand. Forgive me. Understand, no. You you said that you were you were in the altar and you saw Father Gabriel commune. And you spoke about how, at, as he was receiving the chalice, how completely serious his, he was. You said you'd never seen anyone more serious. So I just think this it's interesting, the foolishness on the one hand, the, the absolute seriousness on the other. Could you speak about that? How, how did these, these two fit together in the same person? Foolishness and complete seriousness. What, what was the deeper underlying maybe principle that united both of these aspects in one person. It must have been very, well, just an interesting person. I don't know, foolishness and seriousness. You see, first of all, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to determine what it means, foolishness. Mm-hmm. So what is it? When we say uh, to the, about the person that he's full, uh, full of Christ, but maybe the I, the idea of full. Uh, when uh, when something seems to us not adequate, it's the right word to say adequate. Adequate. Mm-hmm. Adequate. 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 Yes, what? because uh, so some species so when when somebody says something uh, uh, which uh, we think it's not uh, place or not time to say this uh, sentence or his behavior. If I now begin to do something strange now in this interview, so if I bring some hat and put on my hand or <laughs> to be the board, my, yeah, something strange. So we say that it's foolishness. But to be full of Christ, it needs uh, so it's it's the most uh, first of all I want to say that it's the most difficult way uh, so for Christian life to be full mm. of Christ. So uh, I can't. Uh, so we say about him uh, when he was alive, nobody was telling these words about him. So mm-hmm. is this name came later? This uh, okay. so, that he was, so people uh, weren't calling him a fool for Christ during his lifetime. It wasn't no, not happened. really. He was a very serious person, but his behavior was not understandable. Okay. I can't. But when he, in this uh, situation, when I told in my interview, when he came to take communion, so uh, all the strangeness, strangeness, it went away. Mm. And now when I, it, for that time, I did not realize what's happening with me. Because it happened something inside of me when I saw how he takes communion. And then later, I tried to I tried to remember all his movements. So how he came to the chalice and how he corrected something and how he took this and to put, and tried also to repeat this. And it, it's, of course, of course, it's impossible to repeat. Mm-hmm. And then later, now when I'm thinking about this, I remember that it, uh, it not happened uh, visually. It happened inside of me. And mm. it was witness, absolutely witness it. So when you see such person who is a really saint, and it means that he has life contact with God. So it was possible to only to feel that he's now what he's doing now. And he wasn't in, uh, Melpe has explained this to me, um, the first couple of times that I participated in a hierarchical liturgy with Melpe Nicolosi in Georgia, I cried and cried and cried, mm. and cried because I was terrified. <laughs> Not because I was having some real spiritual experience, <sighs> because I was terrified because Meope was so serious. Like you see him mm. laughing and looking gentle and smiling right now when he's so, serving. I think it's, it's not a good example with me. Not good example with me, absolutely. But <laughs> it, it, it's similar, though. I, I can understand so, where he's I'm, coming from because I'm I see trying that. to repeat all this which I have seen. But 
what I want to say about him uh, that uh, that uh, these people, this kind of people who are really who has life faith and who has life contact with God. For that time, I was not able to express this by words and to say this, what I'm saying now. But I'm now absolutely sure that he had life contact with God. And when you watch this, and when you're a witness of this, how is his person? So, you know, once more, I want to repeat, there is understanding that you are reading prayers or you pray. You are taking communion or you are communion, really. Mm. Uh, it was real common. Mm -hmm. And I can't explain now why, but I can just only say that it was. And it, it re I reacted on it. It, it, it. it very much it impressed me. Still, mm -hmm. I am under this impression. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I mean, that's what I mean that he was absolutely serious and uh, not before, just only I can I can just uh, uh, compare or how to say make parallel only with our Patrick. Mm. He's he's uh, absolutely for my understanding and for my deep faith that he's a real living saint. Mm. Our Patrick, absolutely right, absolutely, and just only it remembers me of these two persons. Nobody else, absolutely, in the world. Because I be sure I have met many people, many of clergy, and uh, so these two they're absolutely in another level. Hmm. Well, and of course, and the patriarch, of course, knew Saint Gabriel, and Saint Gabriel honored him. So maybe you know he he got some of that spirit from through Saint Gabriel. You hmm. see. Uh, uh, I, what I can tell about this, that um, this was very, uh, very, it's impossible to, ex uh, maybe somehow later it was be possible to describe this life in these years, 60s, 70s, 80s, beginning of 80s. So uh, our patriarch, uh, how he now returns to us and also what we was we were watching, he was absolutely isolated, isolated, absolutely. And also there was some kind of rule or how to say uh, law or something uh, that uh, it was not, uh, it was not allowed our patriarch to meet the first leader of the country. Their meeting was forbidden, hmm. and he then later he told us so how he was meeting some people uh, who were coming, for example, in Georgia. Uh, maybe so, so he described one meeting with uh, one of the leaders in you know where. Uh, how it's in English, the bath, not bathroom, but the special, uh, the special building where the hot waters and the restroom, um, not restroom, but uh, uh, where you so uh, bathroom where you bathe, huh? where you take a bath, ba bath, and also not only bath, but uh, uh, this um, uh, ah, I forget. So you're going in special place toilet. and there, not toilet, no. No, it's a very special office in which uh, you can uh, make uh, have have this hot hot water. So oh, it's public place. the, the yeah. public baths in Georgia. In public baths in Georgia. Okay. And how he met in this uh -huh. place, for example. So, so he if he he was always closed our patriarch, and he was the same. He was never saying what he really wanted to say. And uh, he was speaking in such a way that you have to understand what he wants to say. And also we have this experience with him. And also absolutely was impossible for him to find Father Gabriel to bring back to the church because he was not allowed as a person. He was out of law. And when first time he heard that Metropolitan Daniel, who is my spiritual father, first time he find him, he brought him to us 
He took him at his home, as he was for that time there just only priest. He lived, he was living at his home. He took him at home. And mm -hmm. so when he heard first about this, our patriarch became very happy with it, very happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, so he somehow, what I would say, it was not official blessing for him because he was not allowed, but he blessed us to be with him. And also then later, how he expressed his uh, his position to him he was uh, he was a, a priest monk hero monk for that time and he gave him uh, this uh, title of archimandrite mm. the only thing what was possible for that time to do uh -huh, i see and then he blessed uh, him then to took him and uh, this uh, convent in which he lived then later and so with his blessing everything and so and so when he lived in San Tavro, that's that's where you would often serve with him i believe yes yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. so another thing you said in that previous interview with Trisajin, um i hope this isn't too personal you don't have to answer but so you you had mentioned that you actually at one time you asked Saint Gabriel for forgiveness. You said he was such a person that you felt like you should be with him. You should leave everything, including your family, because you you were married. You have children. You felt like you should leave everything and go be with him, but but you couldn't. And so you asked his forgiveness. So if I may ask, I mean, how did he respond? Because just. I'm sure there's not many people that have that thought of uh, that would that would approach someone with that saying, "I asking forgiveness for something like that." If 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 you could, if you want to, yes, if, of course I can. Uh, of course I can uh, because uh, this way to be full of Christ, it's very interesting uh, because it's a way that you will never give direct answers. It means that. Uh, you are trying to say something and then later, so people have to think what you wanted to say. And uh, just as, uh, the moment, as I told you, how he was taking communion and he was absolutely serious. He had this uh, just a small seconds maybe of seriousness. And when I told this, so he looked to me, just nothing. He didn't tell nothing, absolutely. And he took looked to me and uh, so in his eyes, uh, so when I looked at him eyes to eyes, I understand that he understands what I'm saying and he agrees and he forgives me this. Mm. Just in, it was one second when he saw me and even just not uh, with head, no, just saw it to me. And uh, it was absolutely understandable. He understood it. And and uh, he agreed, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Understood. Because me, uh, of course, nobody forced me such kind of things. It's impossible to force. I was thinking a lot, and I was thinking a lot how I can leave my wife, my child. I had just only one for that time alone, and to go to him, and I feel myself very. How to say? I feel the. Uh, uh, my weakness that it's impossible to do for me. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Well, since we've raised this topic, maybe we should explain. So you were married and have children. So how we don't want to be, we don't want to uh, leave anyone with questions. How did you? How did it come about that you became a bishop? Uh, it was a long way. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, so with my wife, we begin to learn uh, the uh, scriptures and also this example of holy, holy person and holy lives. And also even it was her idea to, to learn more about such kind of families. Even our child was very, even before I became priest. So we begin to think so about this way, because in the life of St. Nina, uh, who is um, who is our patron? Who is our enlightener of Georgia? Uh, so with her happened the same. Uh, she had a family, 
father, mother, and when she became 12, uh, all them, three of them, they discussed and decided, so three of them to go to different monasteries. Mm. And and it was and God blessed this idea. So we were interesting how it's possible in nowadays. Is it possible or not? And we was a lot thinking about this. And I was even asking to uh, some priests and some uh, monks or so who uh, who are uh, educated on the theology. These people this and also. Uh, I, I did not speak with Patriarch about this, but <clears throat> as soon as I became priest, it was uh, uh, 91 when I became priest, but uh, in 92, His Holiness, our Patriarch, um, um, gave me blessing to become abbot of the monastery. Mm. It's absolutely unusual in the church. Yeah. Priest with family to become a part of a ministry, and uh, well, then you have to consider very... the time period that this was just at the at the fall of the Soviet period, and the number of priests in Georgia and bishops was, you know, very small. Very low. small. They were, yeah, they it were was... they were desperate it for leaders. And right. he suggested, suggested <clears throat> me to be tonsured, and he told me, and he gave three days, so to think about this. It was his idea, but I never spoke that I was thinking about the same. But he told me, three, you have three days and give me the answer. And I mm -hmm. came back to my wife and just only five because we have to had to discuss it together. So we decided it's impossible. And I came back and told him that, no, it's impossible. And after this, so a few years passed. And then later in 95, he suggested to me once more. And in this case, he told me that he wants to be, me to become a bishop. Mm -hmm. And once more, I came back to my wife to discuss, and she said he she is not ready for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was very disappointed because it was her idea first. And uh, so um, so the idea is in, uh, so what what it means it's very important. It never means that I had no right to go to family or to take care of my children or my parents. No, it's only it's not to live together with wife. Mm -hmm. You understand? What I mean? Yeah. So he's saying he's saying right, to right. become a bishop doesn't mean that you abandon your children and don't right and you know uh, don't take care of your children. He certainly or has even on my wife. It I just means that here. he cannot live with his wife as a husband and wife. As a sure. husband and wife, but any other obligations, I have to continue. And then uh, one year we were praying about this. She and me, and so we prayed a lot. Uh, I was uh, awaking 6 a.m. every day before I go to before I had to go to the church praying. And after one year, it happened once more. And His Holiness called me once more and said, what now? What about now? So are you ready to do this? And I said, once more, I will ask. And I asked her and she said, yes, we can do this now. So it was a process. And at that time, by that time, they had three daughters. Three daughters, yes. Okay. And, uh, and I, I had parents. We lived all of us together with my parents in very small apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I had a hope. And I, I was sure somehow about my father that he would take care about family. And really it happened. Mm. Uh, all the children, they grow up with his, uh, uh, with his uh, uh, how to say, obligation. And so with his, his um, leadership. Care, care, leadership. Under his care, sure. So, so I think it's it. Did, when he became a bishop in 1996, Meope went to a convent as the abbot of a convent and became a bishop and his children and wife stayed with his father and mother. And yes. his father took care of they them. They continued to live together, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think it's an important def an important point that this was the uh, the initiative and the blessing of the patriarch. Yeah, so. And it's interesting too that it, his if you, uh, we have some an interview uh, on our YouTube channel of, 
a, a little bit more detailed discussion of this process and what happened. Um, okay. But it was actually his wife and his sister who were the first to kind of encourage him to go to church before he became a priest. They were the first ones mm. to take him to church. And his his sister ended up becoming an abbess of a very important convent in Georgia. She's currently an abbess. And then his his wife, the one who brought him to church, is also the one who agreed to um, to him becoming a bishop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so you've taken up this cross, well, for you know a couple decades now, this cross of the Episcopal, the bishop's ministry. Of course, St. Gabriel, he was a priest, but he was never a bishop. But how, how could you say in your ministry as a bishop, how does St. Gabriel continue to guide you or inspire you? Uh, you see, uh, I... I never forget that I'm bishop, of course, of my about my obligations. But, but uh, I never forget also what I feel when I was a layman and uh, how I was meeting priests, how I was meeting uh, uh, meeting bishops, even in the street, even if they are not vested for that time. Mm. And uh, and once uh, our patriot told us that when I'm speaking with priests, I'm a little afraid of them because in their hands, they have fire. Mm. And he always, and also we, I, I studied many things from him and he respect always now, uh, now priests and bishops. And uh, even I don't know how to explain uh, because in, in your language, in English, you don't have this single or to to speak with somebody you when you say it's uh, always plural and in georgian mm -hmm. language and some another in russian language for example it's e, e, we, uh, right, e, right. and it's a gentle form to speak in plural with person but e, with members of family with very close people you will speak uh, not in plural but in the single yeah yeah. So he never speaks with priests and bishops. Uh, he always speaks in plural, always. Mm -hmm. Always respects. And now for me, uh, nothing changed. As I was, my position was to priests, it stayed in the same way. And just only for that time, when I met another bishop and priest, I'm forgetting who I am. And I just going to them to take blessing. Even I have, uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, common in the church that bishop is taking blessing from priest or uh, sure. his hand to, how to say, venerate. Or, his hand. But yes. uh, yeah, just guess. I, I begin to do this first in our church, <laughs> even to abbesses, even to nuns. Uh, so, and I think that it's very important that you, if you, if you feel that you are somebody, you have to prove it with your... Uh, action and with you care in other people but when you are taking blessing i think and also for in that uh, reason uh, father gabriel he was sent and when i'm now meeting such kind of people of course i'm trying to venerate their hand and of course they try not to give this hand to veneration <laughs> for veneration it reminds me of you know the life of saint mary of egypt where yeah. she asked she asked Father Zosima for the blessing and he says, No, you bless me, you know, you're the holy ascetic here. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Then she said, No, you because you are a priest. Mm -hmm. That's only you, why you you celebrate the Holy Communion. Yes. The Holy Eucharist. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so in our first interview, we talked about Father Seraph, and we've said a lot about St. Gabriel tonight. Um I think it seems to me, at least in my experience, that in general, for the English-speaking Orthodox world, you know, we're familiar with many Greek saints, maybe many Russian saints, but not nearly as many Georgian saints. So other than St. Gabriel, are there any other Georgian saints in particular that you would really like people to know more about? Yes, but... The problem is that uh, we, uh, so because of our history, 
it's not not possible to retell everything. It was uh, the the ancient times when always always our country was in war with uh, so how to say huge monsters around us. We are small mm -hmm. country, very small country, and the huge uh, huge countries kingdoms they wanted to want us, and also we our so citizens they always were holding their uh, swords and so always. And uh, later, Russia, in, geographically, is about the size of South Carolina. To give some perspective, mm -hmm. yes, okay. And the number of us now we have, we are in the, our country about three million people, three million Georgians, and it's all. Uh, so, uh, and maybe in in all the world, maybe we are five, but not more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so in the nineteenth century, in nineteenth century, we were under Russian Empire. And it was even forbidden to, so, to serve in Georgian language. So it was very hard times. And in the Soviet period, it was absolutely impossible. So to be uh, peacefully to have this, uh, how to say, as a science, this theology or history of the church. So we don't know many about Georgian saints. Mm -hmm. And even now I am doing this. As I told you, every Saturday I'm speaking about the people, the saint whom we commemorate this exactly this day. And during my this four year, uh, four year, uh, so this uh, uh, preaching, yes, um, uh, so there were some Georgian saints, and about them, of course, I try to learn. So, the, how to say it's in English, first sources. How we know primary about sources. Prim yeah. primary sources, yes. So about these saints, I can retell, of course, but not about <clears throat> because, of course, generally we have the book, The Life of Georgian Saints, and it's mm -hmm. just briefly retold about them. But so the real stories, I think it's the only way, maybe somehow. Uh, maybe I don't know. We, we think many, many about this about Michelle with Michelle. So to be translated this somehow, I don't know how, because uh, when I'm retelling, this, uh, I think that it's if we we'll write down this only, it not will be so impressive. Because when I'm retelling, I'm expressing something, and you can feel it. And somehow it need to make translation. And in this way, if we we'll do it, I think that these saints will be familiar for all the world. Mm -hmm. and, but he and, is still he's still because he's only been through um you know about two thirds of the year um of the calendar year in his presentations, he still has another third of a year to go in these weekly presentations and he's still learning about the lives of these other Georgian saints. So what, what I think what he's trying to say is yes, there are many Georgian saints that he could tell you about, but he's still learning. Because he's, you yeah. know, it takes you so see, much time to yeah. consult these primary sources. Yes, but you see what I mean. Uh, so why it's very important <clears throat> sources. Generally, I know about all of them, of course. And if you want to, so if you ask about each one, I can retell. But I will not be able to bring this message to you why it's important now for you. Mm -hmm. And when you're learning primary sources, so I try to answer this question. Uh, yes, it happened someday, so may, many years ago, or maybe nowadays, but how we participate on it and how they participate on our life. And mm -hmm. to learn this, I need to all the primary sources to know that to say that that's why this saint is, for example, this Dimitri the second, the king. So what he, if I briefly will tell you what he have done, you will not like him, I think so. <laughs> but, so one of the things that makes his Saturday presentations very unique is that he doesn't just say, <clears throat> you know, this person was born in this century and this is <clears throat> like, and this is what they did and this was their position and these were the miracles they did. But he, he, he researches all all of the sources of the real life stories about how these people interacted in their time period. And then he uh -huh. translates, how does that affect us and how can that speak to us today? Sure. So it's not just a factual recounting of what happened, but a factual recounting of what happened. Plus, how can we take those principles and apply them to us today? Mm-hmm. 
and uh, and sure. what's really important that that now I can find this life of Georgian saints and to make the parallel, how to say, if you find the diamond. So uh, itself, it's very nice. But if you put in crown, so it begins to shine. Mm. And uh, so this crown is, a, as St. Gregory says, it's a life of science. It's not lives because he says it's not grammatically and not with idea, it's not correct. It's one life of all the saints. And if you mm -hmm. understand this life and you retell different stories, and when I'm retelling now about Georgian saints together with another saints who lived absolutely for me, uh, so it was not familiar, for example, Spain of seventh century on uh, the history of Franks, and eighth century, or for example, the first uh, three centuries in Egypt, for example, in third century, fourth century, what's happening? It's very far from here. And but I'm mm -hmm. going to them, and I'm bringing them, and so the, after this, I can see that these Georgian saints who lived in the same period or later, they are member of this family, and mm -hmm. I can show it to you, and I can retell it to you uh, how a Georgian saint or another also, uh, I be, be sure it's also Father Seraphim's idea that uh, uh, John, uh, Bishop John Maximovich was every day uh, coming to them in their uh, in their, this uh, uh, how to say shop or how to say it's a bookstore bo bookstore yeah bookstore and was bringing and he's written he 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 wrote in this uh, Saint Patrick's uh, about Saint Patrick that he was he 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 could come one day and say see here is Saint Alban and uh, here is there is his <clears throat> life so and uh, nobody knew from them yeah. who is Saint Alban for that time. And uh, so there are many saints of this, like this, many. And also in this big family of so Georgian saints, they absolutely they have their place. Yeah. I like that point that it's not the lives of the saints, it's the life of the saints. That's I like that. Oh, it's the life in Christ. Yes. Absolutely. Manifest. So absolutely. manifested in different ways, different ministries. But it's all the same life of Christ in the world. Yeah. I, I would like... It's written in the introduction of uh, Vita Patrum. Vita Patrum, mm -hmm. it's... Uh, so in, in, in English, even we can say life and lives. But in mm -hmm. Latin, it's only Vita. Mm -hmm. Vita. It's only, only it's, uh, single. And uh, he says, uh, Gregory, that uh, it's not only because it's grammar. But we call it Vita Patrum because it's a life of saints. And he explains this. It's a very interesting introduction of Vita Patrum, which was translated in English by Father Seraphim. Right. And St. Herman's uh, Abbot Damascene told me last week that they are actually releasing a new edition of Vita Patrum as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I've, def I've definitely have read that before, but it's, I guess well, I'm very glad that you are bringing that back out. I, I've forgotten about that point. Well, it's very interesting. You're saying you're not just retelling information about the saints. You're talking about what do they mean for us today? How do we take their example today and what to do with it? And we spoke about this with uh, in the first interview. Obviously, mission work, missiology is very important for you. You're the vice chairman, I believe, at this point of the, the patriarchal missionary department. Uh, you have a degree in missiology. Your, your thesis was on missionary work. So could you tell us about, please, about the missionary work in Georgia, in your diocese, and again, the examples of Father Seraphim and St. Gabriel, how they play into that, or your, your thesis concerned the prophet Jonah. How does the prophet Jonah play into missionary works? Uh, I think there's probably a lot of interesting things that could be said here. So it's very... I'll say <laughs> it's my PhD and it's a long story, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, it be begins, if you ask what about, about mission, uh, it begins from this word, what it means. And uh, 
And uh, maybe you'll be surprised and uh, so about this word mission and about mm -hmm. the word apostle I learned from uh, from Lutheran pastor. Mm -hmm. His name is uh, Bob Scudieri, Robert Scudieri, Dr. Robert Scudieri. And absolutely by chance, I find his book in Russian language in internet. And it's of, of course in English language, it's impossible to find this because uh, this pirate, uh, they call it pirate books. Piracy laws. <laughs> Yes, yes. Laws don't allow it to be distributed. It's so very common, and so when I read it, I was so so shocked about this that I called this uh, this. Uh, uh, there is very interesting site website Bible Center. It's Protestants, and I tried. I reached them somehow, and I asked uh, uh, to give me phone number or something, contact of Bob Scudieri, and I called him from Georgia. And so uh, he became very happy, happy, happy because he wrote many years ago this book, and so now I read it, and it, it was I was very impressed. So mm. it's about mission, it's and uh, it's about the word apostle, and uh, I find it in a theological dictionary, which is uh, so ten volumes, and it's uh, uh, many pages about the word, only the word apostle, mm. what it how it comes to us and uh, in uh, in uh, in jewish language uh, before the uh, bible was translated in greek uh, they used in jewish the word mashiach 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 yeah mashiach it was translated as apostle in third century before christ huh. and apostle for that time it had in a different meaning hmm or something like sailor, something like diplomat, the word. The and word, then yeah. It transformed as a as a apostle for uh, and this word apostle and Mashiach uh, in the in the wages of Christ, it has absolutely concrete meaning in Jewish society. And mission and missionary is the same word in Latin. So because it comes from the word mite. It means to send somebody with uh, uh, with message. Mm, and, okay. Yes. And uh, and uh, and the pastor Scudieri he says uh, so. Also they they pronounce credo, credo. Yes, in English. Cre and, credo, the creed. And he said mm -hmm. just only once to his parishioners. So, uh, so in the last sentence, one of the last sentences is that we believe to one holy uh, and Catholic. apostolic church. Catholic apostolic. and apostolic church. Yes, Catholic and apostolic church. And he said just only once. So say this word in Latin. And we trust to one holy Catholic and missionary church. Hmm. And Very this is the idea of mission. Because mission itself it's not something dead or something, uh, how to say, uh, something which is became statement sometimes, somehow. You do understand what I mean? It's not a stale idea. It's not, it's yes. not, a, it's, it's not, a, it's, 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 a, a, it's, a, it's an idea that continues to grow. And, uh, and, mm. uh, and the uh, apostolic church, it has double meaning, this word. When we say apostolic church, it has double meaning. It's a church established by apostles. Mm -hmm. right. And the church who is apostle, who is a right. mission, missionary church. So, and we have never to forget this, yeah. that our church is established by apostles and also it's itself, it's apostle. And we are apostles. And we have to go and bring this message to all the world. And uh, it's impossible. So, uh, and also, this is uh, one of the ideas of Father Seraphim. He says, You are Christian always and everywhere, mm. or you are not Christian. Mm -hmm. If you are going to the church, became Christian, and then going out, you are leaving your Christianity in the church, you are not Christian. 
So this is what we try to do. This is what we try to uh, to contact with young people, and it's absolutely different direction how our department works with young people, with youth. So and uh, what we are doing for them, and so uh, it's it's another story. Absolutely, I can retell how I have summer camps for students since two thousand one, and uh, what kind of programs I have for them. I and, think that uh, the quote from Father Seraphim that he's referencing in English, it's we translate it as orthodoxy. So you're either orthodox all the time or you're not orthodox at all. Uh -huh, of course, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, well, so uh, uh, mission mm -hmm. is this. We are missionaries. <clears throat> well, it's the Christ before Christ resurrected. Before he ascended, he told us, go out and uh, preach all that I have told you, baptize the nations. It's That's the very life of the church is to, we're supposed to, the church is called to sanctify all of creation. We can't do that by just sitting around. <laughs> yeah. And what's uh, uh, you know, under St. Nino's way that uh, we begin to do this? Because after Soviet period, people even were not baptized. Mm -hmm. And we begin to baptize. And someday to us came so huge amount of people that it was not possible to baptize inside of church. We went out first time it happened in 1989. Even I can tell you the date. It was 3rd of, 3rd of June because it was the first Georgian village we met, and we brought all the people, we blessed the river. Oh, I was layman, but I was uh, uh, I was uh, in this time, in this place. And so the priest, they blessed the river, and we took all these people in the river and baptized them. So, and then we continue to do it in all over Georgia. And myself, mm -hmm. I have many, maybe thousands of people I have baptized myself. Hundreds of people, for sure. Sure. So there was this after the, of course, after communism falls, there was this fervor of many people returning to the faith. Uh, has that? Are people staying though? Is there is there a is that a problem in the Georgian Church? If people are once people are converted, do they stay? Do they go deeper into the spiritual life? Uh, how do you work? How do you work with people in that direction? Uh, uh, it's uh, it's not easy. It's not easy because because uh, uh, to be orthodox, it means that you have to witness every day, absolutely. Because when in, in from the very moment you open your eyes and you become awake, so the struggle is coming to you, and all the time you have to do something. And also, I want to use one more fundamental idea of Father Seraphim Rose. He says that you have to, he says, uh, he used the word injection. You have to make injection of orthodoxy every day, to, not to miss the day. Yeah. And he says in which way he would do. And this to make is, is an injection to you, it's not easy. And it needs to be do every day. And the only possibility, so you're preaching to be successful, it's to show the example. You have to do this, first of all, yourself, to fast, to pray, to go to the, not to miss the services, for example. So also to read Holy Scripture and Holy Fathers and comments on the, so if you are not doing this and trying to teach some another, even you are bishop, so it will not be successful, absolutely. So it's a hard work, hard work. And mm -hmm. Also, who is doing this work, he is successful in his preaching and he has parishers. And who is not, so it's less. But we are very lucky to have Patriarch who is doing all this, uh, all this uh, for us. He's alone. Mm -hmm. He's doing this and we just have to follow him. So that's why so we are very happy and it uh, brings its fruits. And under Patriarch Ilya's leadership, I think at the end of the Soviet period, I think there were 200 churches, and now there's almost 3,000 churches in Georgia. Is that correct? No, no 50. <clears throat> there were 50 churches at the end of the Soviet Only 50. Period. Only 15 all for all the Georgia. 
And there's wow. how many now? No, it's it's impossible because every day it's opening new and new churches. Three thousand, maybe three thousand five hundred, like yeah. this. And this know. is all under the direction and leadership of his. Of course, of course, of course. Not only all the bishops in our church are consecrated by him. All bishops. So he's a real father for our church and for our nation. Well, he he's been guiding the church. He's been the the patriarch for like forty five years now. Just celebrated his 45th birthday. But, uh, but uh, how he became monk and priest monk is uh, around 70. Mm -hmm. 1970. No. 70 years. 70 years. Ah, it's around 70. Right, right. Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> That's a lot. Whew. Yeah. That's why we say that he created a epo epochal, or how to say it in English. You understand? Yeah, he he's an he's an entire epic in the Church of epoch. the Georgian Church. He's epoch. an entire yeah. epoch. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. We've talked about before. In so in your diocese, you talked. Uh, I believe we in the first interview with Father Seraphim, we had mentioned about how. You're in the mountainous area, and you're doing a lot. There's a lot of work to bring the village, mountain village people back, and parishes are opening. Mm -hmm. But for the time, but you only have you have one priest who's serving many parishes. I'm curious. Does this in, in these parishes are there are there are candidates for the priesthood uh, being raised up? Does it seem like there are some worthy candidates? You know, ideally, you would have more than one priest for so many parishes. Um, you see, uh, it's not easy to bring some another person to this area because we have yeah. some problems, ethnic problems, yeah. climate, and so and also uh, it's uh, a little uh, far from all the part all from all Georgia. So we need to we need to find people, young people from this area, and we are doing this. Mm -hmm. But it's not, uh, it's not will happen quickly and it's not easy process also to bring, because I think it's my opinion that uh, the priest needs to be educated. And first of all, in theology, but not only. Because to the challenges of modern world, so, uh, so for priests, uh, he needs to be so. And so that's why we created this special uh, theological, how to say, master's degree in theology. We have the school, the priests. And so we have some young people now, but uh, we have no case for, of ordaining them yet. Mm -hmm. But I hope it will happen. Mm -hmm. And so this and, is the... And uh, oh. what's my hope is that uh, since I am in this diocese, so the kids, there are a lot of kids now in the church. Mm. Like God. half the population of his of the parish in Ahakalaki is children 10 and under. <laughs> okay, wow. Okay. <laughs> yes, and I, it's my hope. Even I, I brought this idea from the United States in front of the churches. I saw the icon, especially for kids which is put it under general icon when you go inside in the church and in the center you find icon to venerate to understand what about i'm speaking yeah, so he's talking about when you walk into his parish uh, the archangel michael church and you go to the icon stand where the primary icon for that day of whoever you're commemorating is there is an icon at there's the icon of who we're commemorating that day at at that height you know a normal yeah. like, venerate height and then he has then there's another icon that's below it <clears throat> accessible to children to venerate on their own he right. saw this at a church in michigan no where, where was no, the no, iowa. no 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 i tell you iowa Iowa. Okay, so he okay. saw this done in Iowa. Iowa, not Iowa, but um, uh, Ames. Ames. Oh, Ames. Iowa. Yeah. Ames. Iowa. Ames, Iowa. 
So he saw this idea in Ames, Iowa, which was the parish church of one of his daughters who lived there at the time. And he brought this idea back to his church in Ahakalaki. And he had an icon commissioned of Christ holding the, the little children, um, like is explained in the gospel, come, come to me, all the little children. And he has uh, the relic of St. Ignatius. Yes, he has a relic of St. Ignatius who... Church, church tradition says that he was one of those children that the one that christ put on his on his lap yeah yes and so he has an icon commissioned of this scene of christ with saint ignatius on his lap and then attached to that icon is a relic of saint ignatius and so this mm -hmm. icon is at child level it's maybe 24 inches off the ground maybe sure. a little um, so that the children, all of these children in his parish can come and venerate their own icon without the assistance of their parents. Right. So they can feel like they're like they're doing it themselves. And exactly. They don't have, they don't have to wait oh, for someone to pick them up. They and... their church, yes. Yes. Yeah. And they all rush in. They all rush into the church. And that's the first thing they do. <sighs> is <venerate> that icon. <laughs> nice. Well, do you remember the, at this church in Ames, was that Father Martin Watt? Martin. Do you remember? Was it Martin? Yeah. Meet his family name? No. What? 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 Yes. What? Yes. 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 He, he baptized my first grandchild. Ah. Yeah, he was my was... class. Oh, really? He was my classmate at seminary. Yeah. Oh, in a small yeah. world. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, he's yeah. a very nice person, and we became yeah. very friends. And... He baptized my first uh, grandchild, and so we served together. It happened in Transfiguration when I came to them, and the child was born a few days old, and uh -huh. so Transfiguration, the celebration, and his name, my child's name, was Elia because he was born in St. Elias Day uh, with old-style calendar. And um, mm. Patriarch yeah. Elia, exactly during the liturgy. And Patriarch became his godfather. Ah, wonderful. He baptized, yes. Yes, and I took this idea from Father Martin. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Well, and of course, the Patriarch has thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of godchildren now. Yes, yeah. it was. Glory to God. Um, yeah. His greatest ideas. So, which yeah. helped to born people, children. Trying to encourage the the expansion of the Orthodox population in Georgia, right? Because he said he will be godfather, uh, uh, so the third child, right? So people begin to create these children. <laughs> so, yeah. You... Well, it's wonderful that you have a pri you know a, pr a primate, as we say, you know, a patriarch that's so beloved. It seems like you know. As you said, there are some people who say some nasty things about him, but it seems that overall he's just completely beloved, trusted, loved by the people. And the and so people who say those horrible things are anti-Christian as a whole. They, you know, not just against him. Okay, they're against so anything. They're against kind anything of people, such her. kind of people exist in all the world, and I was so surprised first when I saw him to see the shroud. It was brought out. Shroud mm. and yeah, yeah. outside it was some concert or something against shroud. <laughs> Imagine what it was. So people okay. are crazy, absolutely crazy. They had a meeting and so the singing <laughs> and doing something, and it was against the shroud. Mm -hmm. But it exists. <laughs> what what against of it? I don't know. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. So they were against Christ. And they were shouting, so kill him and uh, crucify him. Mm -hmm. He's not so terrible. Nothing. He was, yeah, but he he remained silent to their accusations and only prayed for them to be forgiven. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's an example for us. Well, again, I think we've said a lot. Would you have? Do you have any? Parting words for us? Any words of inspiration or any last any last thoughts? Uh, one more thing which I learned from these contemporary saints. 
is that when I was first reading the life of St. Nicholas, he began to make miracles before he was born. And when he was born, he stayed in a so three, three days old child. He was staying in this uh, baptisterium on his feet. Baptistry. Mm -hmm. Baptistry, yes. And then he was fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, he was not eating the milk. Right. When I was reading this, I was absolutely inspired and trusting to him. But in another hand, I was very disappointed <laughs> because I was not doing this when I was born. <laughs> and it seems that I will never be uh, close to him and uh, like to him. It's impossible. But when I begin to read the life of modern saints, who we are born in the same situation and uh, graduating some like uh, me, the universities, for example, right. Father Seraphim Rose, uh, when he graduated. And uh, so this uh, profession is was something like to me. When it's uh, um, uh, it's uh, uh, how to say this, uh, I forget this word, this to learn this ancient languages um, uh, to be so how it's in English, the science, to learn the language. Maybe philology. Not philology. philology. He uh, was... He was um, no, ling he linguistics, was, perhaps. Linguistics, yes. Yeah. Yes. Linguistics is very close to mathematics. Hmm. Absolutely. And uh, when I also do was doing the same, uh, learning mathematics, physics, and then I came to the church, and I... Uh, so his words I read that uh, how he felt himself at home when he came to the Orthodox Church so it uh, it gives me example that I have I can do the same mm, right how it's possible and so see what's very important if it's possible to be saint it's obligation Hmm. If it's possible you to be saint, you have to be. And it's very important for an uh, our day's life because people can tell you, of course, you are teaching me to, to pray, to fast, and to do everything, but I'm not a saint. And I will not do all this because you can't, uh, you can't uh, ask from me this because I'm not a saint. Why you are not a saint? If you can be the saint, so it's you'll be punished. So it's very you have to be very cautious with this. And if so Father Sarah, what Melba is ex explaining, we discussed this a few days ago. That one of the important ideas behind finding these modern saints is that when we are discussing saints that are in you know the first and second and third century, it's very easy for us to kind of dismiss. Uh, the seriousness of their lives because, well, they don't understand, you know, uh, what it's like to, to live in the Western world or they don't understand what it's like to live in postmodernism, so on and so forth. And so I don't have to live like that because I'm not a first or second or third century person. Mm -hmm. So one of the important parts about um, finding these modern saints is that they were living this very serious orthodox life in postmodernism for example father seraphim rose and so if father seraphim could live this very serious orthodox life in postmodernism so can we yeah and we are it's much harder for us to dismiss oh well that was you know the third century things are totally different now so we don't have to do that okay but what about father seraphim what about what Father George Kalchuk? What about Father John Maximovich? What about Mother Olga? They all lived in this time period, very serious lives. So you can't dismiss as easily the life that they lived. And so if they can live that life in the life of Christ, so can we. And not only can we, we must. Mm -hmm. yes. It is our responsibility to do so. And not use the time period as an excuse to get out of living a serious Orthodox life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, during Lent, I've been rereading my words. <laughs>
During Lent, I've been rereading the biography of Elder Joseph the Hesychast, you know, written by Elder Ephraim, his spiritual child. This, uh, my Elder Joseph the Hesychast, since you can see, I mean, he reposed in 1959, so not quite as contemporary as Father Seraphim or St. Gabriel, but basically our contemporaries. His, the level of it, he was just, he was just so completely dedicated to finding Christ, finding true prayer, uniting with God, and just the level of asceticism, of sacrifice, of, of, of seriousness is just like, it's amazing. It's amazing to see that from somebody in basically our times. And, and I, I find that some people, sometimes they think, as you've said, well, I'm not a saint, you know, his example is too far from me, but you can always at least be inspired by, I think, by their spirit to do at least do a little bit more. Of course, I'm not going to become St. Joseph the Hesychast tomorrow. But I can maybe, you know, do at least take a bit of his spirit and do a little bit more. I feel like we could try at least. Small steps. Every yeah. Shag shagam, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Step by step. All right. I think I think that'll do it for today. I hope we thank you again for uh, giving us your time once again. I think it was a very profitable talk. And um, well, as we said before, maybe ho hopefully we will keep in touch. Maybe we could do some mo more talks later. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, thank you, Michelle. And thank you very much for questions. Because always when I'm meeting people, uh, so my parishes or new new spiritual children I'll telling to them most important they are questions mm. if you will have questions <clears throat> you can have contact if you will stop giving questions so it means that we will stop our active connection mm -hmm. so thank you so much very interesting questions and for me it was very interesting. thank you thank god so wait, may you, because you give us your blessing again May God bless you and to be blessed always. Thank you. Mm -hmm.